Chapter seventy of Barnaby Rudge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Barnaby Rudge by Charles Dickens. Chapter seventy. Mr. Dennis, having dispatched this piece of business without any personal hurt or inconvenience, and having now retired into the tranquil respectability of private life, resolved to solace himself with half an hour or so of female society. With this amiable purpose in his mind, he bent his steps towards the house where Dolly and Miss Haredale were still confined, and whither Miss Miggs had also been removed by order of Mr. Simon Tappertit. As he walked along the streets with his leather gloves clasped behind him, and his face indicative of cheerful thought and pleasant calculation, Mr. Dennis might have been likened unto a farmer ruminating among his crops, and enjoying by anticipation the bountiful gifts of Providence. Look where he would, some heap of ruins afforded him rich promise of a working off. The whole town appeared to have been ploughed and sown, and nurtured by most genial weather, and a goodly harvest was at hand. Having taken up arms, and resorted to deeds of violence, with the great main object of preserving the old bailey in all its purity, and the gallows in all its pristine usefulness and moral grandeur, it would perhaps be going too far to assert that Mr. Dennis had ever distinctly contemplated and foreseen this happy state of things. He rather looked upon it as one of those beautiful dispensations which are inscrutably brought about for the behoof and advantage of good men. He felt, as it were, personally referred to in this prosperous ripening for the gibbet, and had never considered himself so much the pet and favourite child of destiny, or loved that lady so well, or with such a calm and virtuous reliance in all his life. As to being taken up himself for a rioter, and punished with the rest, Mr. Dennis dismissed that possibility from his thoughts as an idle chimera, arguing that the line of conduct he had adopted at Newgate, and the service he had rendered that day, would be more than a set-off against any evidence which might identify him as a member of the crowd. That any charge of companionship which might be made against him by those who were themselves in danger would certainly go for naught and that if any trivial indiscretion on his part should unluckily come out, the uncommon usefulness of his office at present, and the great demand for the exercise of its functions, would certainly cause it to be winked at and passed over. In a word, he had played his cards throughout with great care, had changed sides at the very nick of time, had delivered up two of the most notorious rioters, and a distinguished felon to boot, and was quite at his ease." saving, for there is a reservation, and even Mr. Dennis was not perfectly happy, saving for one circumstance, to wit, the forcible detention of Dolly and Miss Haredale in a house almost adjoining his own. This was a stumbling-block, for if they were discovered and released, they could, by the testimony they had it in their power to give, place him in a situation of great jeopardy, and to set them at liberty, first extorting from them an oath of secrecy and silence, was a thing not to be thought of. It was more, perhaps, with an eye to the danger which lurked in this quarter, than from his abstract love of conversation with the sex, that the hangman, quickening his steps, now hastened into their society, cursing the amorous natures of Hugh and Mr. Tappertit with great heartiness at every step he took. When he entered the miserable room in which they were confined, Dolly and Miss Haredale withdrew in silence to the remotest corner. But Miss Miggs, who was particularly tender of her reputation, immediately fell upon her knees, and began to scream very loud, crying, "'What will become of me? Where is my Simmons? Have mercy, good gentlemen, on my sex's weaknesses!' with other doleful lamentations of that nature, which she delivered with great propriety and decorum. "'Miss, miss,' whispered Dennis, beckoning to her with his forefinger, "'come here. I won't hurt you. Come here, my lamb, will you?' On hearing this tender epithet, Miss Miggs, who had left off screaming when he opened his lips, and had listened to him attentively, began again, crying, "'Oh, I'm his lamb! He says I'm his lamb! "'Oh, gracious, why wasn't I born old and ugly? "'Why was I ever made to be the youngest of six, "'and all of them dead and in their blessed graves, "'excepting one married sister, "'which is settled in Golden Lion Court, number 27, second bell handle on the—' "'Don't I say I ain't a-going to hurt you?' said Dennis, pointing to a chair. "'Why, miss, what's the matter?' "'I don't know what may it be the matter,' cried Miss Miggs, "'clasping her hands distractedly. "'Anything may be the matter.' "'But nothing is, I tell you,' said the hangman. First, stop that noise, and come and sit down here, will you, Chucky?' The coaxing tone in which he said these latter words might have failed in its object, if he had not accompanied them with sundry sharp jerks of his thumb over one shoulder, and with divers winks and thrustings of his tongue into his cheek, from which signals the damsel gathered that he sought to speak to her apart concerning Miss Haredale and Dolly.' 
Her curiosity being very powerful, and her jealousy by no means inactive, she arose, and with a great deal of shivering and starting back, and much muscular action among all the small bones in her throat, gradually approached him. "'Sit down,' said the hangman. Suiting the action to the word, he thrust her rather suddenly and prematurely into a chair, and designing to reassure her by a little harmless jocularity, such as is adapted to please and fascinate the sex, converted his right forefinger into an ideal bradawl or gimlet, and made as though he would screw the same into her side, whereat Miss Miggs shrieked again and evinced symptoms of faintness. "'Lovey, my dear,' whispered Dennis, drawing his chair close to hers, "'when was your young man here last, eh?' "'My young man, good gentleman,' answered Miggs, in a tone of exquisite distress. "'Ah, Simmons, you know him,' said Dennis. "'Mine, indeed,' cried Miggs, with a burst of bitterness, and as she said it she glanced towards Dolly. "'Mine, good gentleman!' This was just what Mr. Dennis wanted, and expected. "'Ah,' he said, looking so soothingly, not to say amorously, on Miggs, that she sat, as she afterwards remarked, on pins and needles of the sharpest Whitechapel kind, not knowing what intentions might be suggesting that expression to his features. "'I was afraid of that. I saw as much myself. That's her fault. She will entice em. "'I wouldn't,' cried Miggs, folding her hands and looking upwards with a kind of devout blankness. "'I wouldn't lay myself out as she does. I wouldn't be as bold as her. I wouldn't seem to say to all male creatures, "'Come and kiss me,' and here a shudder quite convulsed her frame, "'for any earthly crowns as might be offered. Worlds,' Miggs added solemnly, "'should not reduce me. No, not if I was weenus.' "'Well, but you are weenus, you know,' said Mr. Dennis, confidentially. "'No, I am not, good gentleman,' answered Miggs, shaking her head with an air of self-denial, which seemed to imply that she might be if she chose, but she hoped she knew better. "'No, I am not, good gentleman. Don't charge me with it.' Up to this time she had turned round every now and then, to where Dolly and Miss Haredale had retired, and uttered a scream or groan or laid her hand upon her heart, and trembled excessively, with a view of keeping up appearances and giving them to understand that she conversed with the visitor under protest and on compulsion, and at a great personal sacrifice, for their common good. But at this point Mr. Dennis looked so very full of meaning, and gave such a singularly expressive twitch to his face, as a request to her to come still nearer to him, that she abandoned these little arts, and gave him her whole and undivided attention. "'When was Simmons here, I say?' quoth Dennis, in her ear. "'Not since yesterday morning, and then only for a few minutes. Not all day the day before.' "'You know, he meant all along to carry off that one,' said Dennis, indicating Dolly by the slightest possible jerk of his head, and to hand you over to somebody else. Miss Miggs, who had fallen into a terrible state of grief when the first part of the sentence was spoken, recovered a little at the second, and seemed, by the sudden check she put upon her tears, to intimate that possibly this arrangement might meet her views, and that it might perhaps remain an open question. "'But unfortunately,' pursued Dennis, who observed this, "'somebody else was fond of her too, you see, and even if he wasn't, somebody else is took for a rioter, and it's all over with him.' Miss Biggs relapsed. "'Now I want,' said Dennis, "'to clear this house and to see you righted. What if I was to get her off, out of the way, eh?' Miss Miggs, brightening again, rejoined with many breaks and pauses from excess of feeling that temptations had been Simmons's bane, that it was not his fault but hers, meaning Dolly's, that men did not see through these dreadful arts as women did, and therefore was caged and trapped as Simmons had been, that she had no personal motives to serve, far from it, on the contrary her intentions was good towards all parties, but for as much as she knowed that Simmons, if united to any designing and artful minxes, she would name no names, for that was not her dispositions. To any designing and artful minxes must be made miserable and unhappy for life, she did incline towards prevention's. Such, she added, was her free confessions. But as this was private feelings, and might perhaps be looked upon as vengeance, she begged the gentleman would say no more. Whatever he said, wishing to do her duty by all mankind, even by them as had ever been her bitterest enemies, she would not listen to him. With that she stopped her ears, and shook her head from side to side, to intimate to Mr. Dennis that though he talked until he had no breath left, she was as deaf as any adder. "'Looky here, my sugar-stick,' said Mr. Dennis. "'If your view's the same as mine, and you'll only be quiet and slip away at the right time, I can have the house clear to-morrow and be out of this trouble. Stop, though. There's the other. 
"'Which other, sir?' asked Miggs, still with her fingers in her ears, and her head shaking obstinately. "'By the tallest one yonder,' said Dennis, as he stroked his chin, and added, in an undertone to himself, something about not crossing Mr. Gashford. Miss Miggs replied, still being profoundly deaf, that if Miss Haredale stood in the way at all, he might make himself quite easy on that score, as she had gathered from what passed between Hugh and Mr. Tappertit when they were last there, that she was to be removed alone, not by them, but by somebody else, to-morrow night. Mr. Dennis opened his eyes very wide at this piece of information, whistled once, considered once, and finally slapped his head once, and nodded once, as if he had got the clue to this mysterious removal, and so dismissed it. Then he imparted his design concerning Dolly to Miss Miggs, who was taken more deaf than before when he began, and so remained all through. The notable scheme was this. Mr. Dennis was immediately to seek out from among the rioters some daring young fellow, and he had one in his eye, he said, who, terrified by the threats he could hold out to him, and alarmed by the capture of so many who were no better and no worse than he, would gladly avail himself of any help to get abroad and out of harm's way with his plunder, even though his journey were encumbered by an unwilling companion. Indeed, the unwilling companion, being a beautiful girl, would probably be an additional inducement and temptation. Such a person found, he proposed to bring him there on the ensuing night, when the tall one was taken off, and Miss Miggs had purposely retired, and then that Dolly should be gagged, muffled in a cloak, and carried in any handy conveyance down to the river's side, where there were abundant means of getting her smuggled snugly off in any small craft of doubtful character, and no questions asked. With regard to the expense of this removal, he would say, at a rough calculation, the two or three silver tea or coffee-pots, with something additional for drink, such as a muffineer or toast-rack, would more than cover it. Articles of plate of every kind, having been buried by the rioters in several lonely parts of London, and particularly, as he knew, in St. James's Square, which, though easy of access, was little frequented after dark, and had a convenient piece of water in the midst, the needful funds were close at hand, and could be had upon the shortest notice. With regard to Dolly, the gentleman would exercise his own discretion. He would be bound to do nothing but to take her away and keep her away. All other arrangements and dispositions would rest entirely with himself. If Miss Miggs had had her hearing, no doubt she would have been greatly shocked by the indelicacy of a young female's going away with a stranger by night, for her moral feelings, as we have said, were of the tenderest kind. But directly Mr. Dennis ceased to speak, she reminded him that he had only wasted breath. She then went on to say, still with her fingers in her ears, that nothing less than a severe practical lesson would save the locksmith's daughter from utter ruin, and that she felt it, as it were, a moral obligation and a sacred duty to the family to wish that some one would devise one for her reformation. Miss Miggs remarked, and very justly, as an abstract sentiment which happened to occur to her at the moment, that she dared to say the locksmith and his wife would murmur and repine, if they were ever, by forcible abduction or otherwise, to lose their child, but that we seldom knew in this world what was best for us, such being our sinful and imperfect natures, that very few arrived at that clear understanding. Having brought their conversation to this satisfactory end, they parted. Dennis, to pursue his design and take another walk about his farm, Miss Miggs, to launch, when he left her, into such a burst of mental anguish, which she gave them to understand was occasioned by certain tender things he had had the presumption and audacity to say, that little Dolly's heart was quite melted. Indeed, she said, and did so much to soothe the outraged feelings of Miss Miggs, and looked so beautiful while doing so, that if the young maid had not had ample vent for her surpassing spite and a knowledge of the mischief that was brewing, she must have scratched her features on the spot. End of chapter 70